Hello YouTube, my name is Patrick and this is my channel 1984. Today we're gonna take a look at this MSI board. It's a socket A board and its model, mod, model is K70 Turbo 2. So it's a VIA chipset KT133A. So it uses PC133. It obviously has AGP and PCI. And it has a 12 volt connector here, so you can actually go out and buy a brand new 8x power supply. And that's why this board is so nice. I actually fixed up one of these boards before. So this is the second one I have in now. Another thing with this particular revision, because there are multiple revisions of this. The other one I did was a revision 5. And it's not called the K70 Turbo 2, it just has the MS6C30 on it. Which you can actually find on this board down here too. But this one actually has an ISA slot or could have one. So my plan is actually to add an ISA slot to it, like so, basically. But the, the main problem with this board here is the caps. So if we zoom in here, we can actually see the caps. And as you can see, you can probably see this one over here. It's already swollen and it has leaked and it's dried up. And its friend here has the same issue going on. So, a problem with these boards and a lot of boards from this era is that the caps go bad. And uh, so yeah, after 20 years and uh, usual time to replace the caps anyway. But this is uh, from the era when uh, the capacitor plate was raging. So I'm gonna assume all the caps are bad on this board. And since I did another board, I already have bought caps since I had a cap list for this particular model. I bought some uh, different caps here, they should uh, be the right ones. A little bit, uh, some uh, mostly Worth and uh, German Worth and uh, Philips, I think. So I'm gonna throw on it. Also got uh, some of these uh, SMD mounted ones. I'm gonna replace those too. So once we replace the caps and added the ISA slot, we can actually try and see if we can use the ISA on this one. I'm fairly sure it should work. There's no obvious SMD stuff missing. And from what I read, people have already done this. I uh, found a Vogon thread, so I shouldn't be the first doing this. And it seems to be working. So that will be, it'll be quite nice with the uh, socket A with ISA, that's not uh, that common, and especially not with the 12 volt too. So basically you can run old sound card, uh, you can have your modern power supply, basically you can quite easily build up a very serviceable and flexible system with this board. And for people who are interested in what caps this board uses, I have a list up here on the screen so you can see the location and the values and the size. And uh, like I said, the board on the screen and this board are basically the same. They're both MS6330 boards. Slightly dif different revisions. The one on the monitor here, my, on my, my previous one I did, doesn't have the ISA option. But it has the same 12 volt, the same caps, the same chips with everything. It's basically the same. So let's get capping then. So here I'm preheating the board to make it easier to remove the caps. It also makes it easier to uh, wick the holes clean from the solder later. So I'm just adding some uh, new leaded solder there. That helps removing the cat to get the, get the old solder to melt. So I'm adding a little bit of flux here, it's Amtec, uh, Amtec no clean flux. And then I'm using my 4.8mm tip and uh, some solder wick here to basically suck the tin out of the holes. The, they will, the tin will flow to, to the heat source, so the iron in this case.
I'm just using some electronic cleaner here to uh, clean, uh, clean away the flux residue. Makes it e obviously easy to inspect uh, the holes and also when you're gonna start back the caps uh, you want it clean, especially on the other side where the caps go. So this area was also preheated with the hot air station. You could use something else to preheat it with. Like I took it up to just over 100 C centigrade. Found that to uh, work quite nicely. As you can see the, the solder was just sucked straight out of the holes. So I have removed uh, the radial mounted capacitor. So I'm gonna move on to the SMD ones and remove those. So now there are a few different ways you can remove the surface mounted electrolytics. You could obviously hot air off them off if you want to, but uh, it might the problem will start leak or blow up technically you could if they don't leak. But uh, another problem is obviously if you have anything plastic around, you have to shield that so you don't risk melting it. And also what people like to do. What try to do is to come in like with this soldering iron here on one side and then try to like lift that side uh, so you, you tilt the whole cap over. The problem is when even if you get the, like on this side, the right side here free, you're likely to rip the left side because the legs are basically, basically going through this plastic frame here and now they're bent underneath in a 90 degree bend and flattened. So you're likely to lift the pads on the opposite side because they have nowhere to go. They're pushing up. The other leg is pushing up against the plastic base. Though because they are bent 90 degrees and flattened, the, the weakest points on the legs on one of these is actually at the bend. And the strongest way, the pad is strongest sideways. So like this or like this. It's like if you take a piece of uh, tape to your desk. You can quite easily peel tape by, by uh, you know, lifting it, not, not straight up, but uh, if you tape it down and then start peeling it and pulling it straight up, you're gonna have pretty easy time getting it off. But if you try to push a piece of tape sideways that you put down on a desk, you're not gonna be able to push that thing. So the, the pad is strongest sideways in a direction along the PCB but it's weakest if you try to pull it and it's even weaker if you heat it from my experience so if you try to then pull this side while trying to desolder it you're probably putting heat into everything then you're even more likely to drip the other side so what's the easy thing to actually do which is counterintuitive but a lot of people actually do it even professionals and that's exactly to twist this thing a lot of people just twist it 180 off but what I prefer to do, and you can even do it with your, with your fingers, you can, I uh, can't really see, but I'm just applying some pressure and twisting it like so until I feel that it, it stops coming. And you're pushing a bit down because as you're twisting, the legs start, start to tilt inside uh, like so. Tilt like so. If you imagine them tilting when you rotate like a screw. That means they get relatively shorter, so you should push down on it if you do this. You don't want to pull. So if you can't get it with your fingers, I usually use a small caliber, something like this. And I prefer the do not twist 180 method, so I prefer the twisting a little bit either way, because it's gonna fatigue the legs and you push down a little bit. We're talking very little force here. It's, um, can't really measure it, but uh, just a little bit. And right, I don't know if you can see the the black stamp there, like the negative. But uh, if you can see it moving, and this is what you want to do: and a slight push down. I don't want to push hard, so you risk damaging the board if you lose your grip. And usually, what happens is that one side snaps off. I can actually feel it with my hand now. Not uh, at the, the pad, snaps up just above the pad in the 90 degree bend. And what's happening is usually the other one is stuck in the cap. 
but that's the second weak spot usually inside the cap. Once you get one leg off, you can basically turn around the leg, the cap, and then that leg will detach from the cap too. So this cap is coming loose, and there it came. So as you can see, here we got the cap. I can feel, you can basically feel it pop, and here is the base I was talking about. So what's the only difference really between one of these caps? surface mounted and an ordinary radial mounted that we removed before is this base. The leg go through that are basically bent sharply 90 degrees and flattened and that's where the weak spot is in the middle. It's already fatigued from fracture you could say. So I don't think I can zoom anymore currently with my camera here. But let's see here. Here are the pads. So hopefully you can see and both legs are actually left. What what's broke off is just exactly where I turn 90 degrees straight up. And I've been using this for at least two years now. I have had zero failures with this method. And you can find some other popular YouTubers that have tried this and used this. And I also talked to people who actually work with electronics that say that this is very high likely to work. But the thing is, as always, you should always try on something that's broken, something you can practice on until it's fig you figure out. Because what you need a method that works for you and for what you're working on. It, if this doesn't work, if you know this doesn't work on your particular PCB, just something special, or it's highly corroded or something, you might have to find another way. Uh, but this works very well on any kind of decent quality PCB that ha doesn't have any damage. As far as I noticed, I haven't had any issues. So that's how I get them off. If you have, an, have, a, if you have another idea of getting them, them off that works for you, you can put that in the comments. Uh, always welcome more ideas. And once you get them off, obviously, you just clean it up with your soldering iron. You can you get the what's left of the legs, you get off the pads, and you clean the pads with your wick. So, very easy. And some caps go off in like one or two small twists, other ones need like 30. Uh, and like I said, some people just twist them 180. Um, I rather take my time since it's often repair other people's stuff, and I really don't feel like ripping the pelt and have to repair them. So I rather take some extra time than having to spend time later. This one has gone on one side, and they went the other side. Let's clean this pad up. Pads. Put them clean so I can solder new caps later. So I let it solder. Pads are fine and happy, happy pads. The next thing to do would actually be to look at the ISA slot. So we're gonna have to clean out all these holes over here. So I figure we preheat the board, backside probably, and then try to see if we can wick that out. Uh, so we can put in a new ISA connector. Well, well new, it's. Uh, I liberated it from a, from our dead motherboard, so it misses his mother, needs a new mother. Yeah, I'm gonna put that in. So I'm gonna heat the board on uh, the top side a little bit first, just to get some heat on this side. I'm gonna flip it over and heat it on the other side. I'm probably gonna have to do this in uh, multiple times to get all the holes clean. So this temperature is about 275, about an inch away, or 25, 2 to 3 centimeters at least here. 
so it won't melt anything or anything like that. So, I think the holes are all nice and clean now. We'll find out soon enough. See if this thing actually fits this ISI slot thingy. That went very nicely. So, I'm gonna inspect this and make sure it's all sitting right now. The next looks good, so I should probably solder it a little bit into place so it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, pretty cool that thing. We got with an ISA slot on an, a socket A board. Pretty cool. I'm gonna try that out with uh, one of my known good sound cards once we get to testing. So next thing is caps. I'm gonna use my sheet sheet uh, diagram I showed before. I'm gonna show it here again with the cap layout here. So I know where everything goes and I know the polarity too, just in case. Uh, in this case white is negative, that's not always the case. So let's get started. So I have operated these from 6.3 volts to 10 volts, but it doesn't really matter. The important thing here is since they're around, uh, since they're basically around uh, add-on cards. 
that they're not not higher than the actual uh, slots. That's the important part here. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter the higher voltage. But the same capacity, 1000 UF microfarads. And for the last set of radial caps, I got some uh, 4700 UF 6.3 volts. So exactly the same as the old ones. I don't think even the dimensions, the height, everything is the same. These are some uh, relatively beefy caps. So the four of these. All the radar caps are in place. I think it turned out pretty well. So the only thing left to do now, other than the radar caps, is uh, putting on the SMD caps we removed before and clean the pads for. So that will be my next job. So I'm just gonna add some flux here to build pads. Then I'm just going to tin the one. Like so. And then I'm going to tape my cap. Make sure it's the right way around. Then I'm going to feed it in here. And then I'm gonna add some flux on the other side again. I just add some more t solder there, just to make sure. So now I think we got a good uh, new SMD electrolytic mounted there. So it's another five or so ago. So that should be all the caps on the whole board here now. So the SMD electrolytics and the radial ones. And the ISO is in place. So cleaning, checking everything over. And uh, then we can test it. And see how everything works. So we're back with the board. I have cleaned it and uh, Put it in the oven to dry. 
So this is the result. So you can take a shot here. I think it came out pretty well. Looks like new. And here's our ISA slot. So we should uh, install a CPU, some RAM and test the board out. I will be using a Duron 700 here. I don't care about that really. I have a few 800s too. So we have a working board. So now what I would like to do is test out some sound cards. We're gonna look at those sound cards and uh, see what happens here. So to my left here I have an AVE 64. It's a value card I think this. I got it recently and I know it's good. I tested it twice already. It's, it's good. This one is also tested. This is a some lost the 16, a Vibra 16S. And uh, just quick on the gold, it's a CT4520. And this some lost the 16 is a CT2800. Uh, and over here I took out a 486, this is an ESS ES1868F. Uh, the thing is, this, someone got this to work in, in the board I put the ISA slot on. And um, so, and someone also got a CT2290 to work, but this is a, like I said, a 2800. And from what I read, uh, someone tried an A32 and that didn't work, so A64 might not. So I'm gonna try these cards out, let's see what happens. So. Here is the ESS 1868 and it detected as an ISA PNP device. Now I'm gonna try the A64, it should show up there too if it's working. And I have the A64 in the system right now, so I can show you that. So as you can see, it's occupied and there's no detection. So there's no ISA PNP on the, in the boot here and we can load Windows here. I actually have drivers installed too for DOS here. They work with Sunlost 16 and uh, A64 and should work with A32 if I recall too. So, I have a not non-installed some of the 16 there, but it's not relevant right now. Setting control panel. And I also tried to add the some of the 16 there, but you get like an exclamation mark just like with the some of the 16 there. Uh, so. Yep. so we can search for for it. It says it's a plug and play card, it should be auto-detected on my other via board with an Intel CPU, it's auto detected once Windows boots. And in the drivers install automatically, so it should have done that if it was working. So finish here. And as you can see, there's there's no audio device here at all. So the whistle doesn't find anything either, and it shouldn't have to be run because it's a plug and play card. So the sound blaster, the A64 doesn't work, and it doesn't work with the DOS driver either. They just complain that there's no device. Uh, the IQs and DMAs are wrong, and those work on my other system. So now I'm gonna try the sound blaster 16. So the CT2800, uh, the Sunlot 16 is installed now, 
it's not really a plug and play card, so it's need the hard hardware wizard to work. So we won't shouldn't see it here on the ISA PMP stuff as far as I know. So it's not showing up should be normal. So if we add the card to the wizard now, should work. So it installed something, and uh, I've tried pretty much anything in BIOS related to plug and play, and ISA, the IQs, everything, and nothing really helps with A64 to get the, the system to see it or the drivers to see it. And where's sound? Device manager sound. I have a sound loss to 16. Properties, resources to 20, T30, 537. And we can play a MIDI. Check here. Let's see the credit here. Got our uh, see Duron 700. I think we pushed that. Here we got our ship set. So you can see we have here called the KT 133X. So basically, what we have, I think it's called KT 133A to be exact for the AMD system. So on this board you can run up to Atlan XP 2600 plus uh, with the sound loss to 16 if you want. So you can play games in DOS if you want, so that's pretty nice. Some good sound support. And I actually have installed the DOS drivers. I well I have pre-installed one, I just extracted so I put uh, and let's edit here. So I put the stuff in here in the out exact uh, these lines here and here from one of my old configs. And uh, the actual drivers are here. They work with, uh, also works with the A64 if it had worked, but uh, that's not with the system, this motherboard. We actually go into DOS if we want and run some, say, Duke Nukem with Doom. I also did install the latest BIOS in this motherboard, which gives me, like I said, Atom XP support and uh, USB boot, but uh, nothing didn't help with the 64. And only. So now it's searching for the card and so on, it seems to work. Configure the card. Sound set up here, and I already selected everything. But you can see 537 just like in Windows, the DMAs and everything. And it shows music, I got sound lost here. Test sound. So yeah, I said that it works. I think we can run some Doom too. I think it's already configured when I tested before. We'll find out soon enough. Yeah, sound go ahead. So yeah, Sound Blast 16 seems to work fine. I didn't load the drivers for the ES 18.6k, but from what I read that card should work and it was detected, so 
If it's detected, you should be able to load the drivers, I figure. Uh, A64 doesn't seem to work from what I've read, only A32 the tested didn't work either. I don't know if there are non-plug and play of that card that uh, uses the wizard in Windows. It might work if it's some old dawn. And the C2290 also reported working too, that I think is the some lost to 16 too, or if so, even older. So a few cards that work, some that don't. My VGA card I tried did not work, my ISA VGA card. Um, so it's Logic 5429, but someone else had two cards working, but I don't know what card the cards those were, and I don't have any other to test with. So ISA card is a bit hit and miss on this board, but uh, as far as I can tell, it was never sold with the ISA slot installed. Uh, from what I can see, so they probably never iron out any bugs or anything around that, so. So yeah, the board is recapped, ISA slot installed, some ISA card or sound card works, some don't. And so, but that at least more the no ISA compatibility at all. So I would call it a success anyway, if, if you can always wish for better compatibility. But it still opens up the possibility of having a proper sound card for DOS on a high performance machine. So you can quite easily run a PCI sound card for Windows and then an ISA card for DOS. You can join us on our Discord server. We host public LANs when possible and game nights on our server hosting many old classical multiplayer games like Quake, Counter Strike and much more. Or you can show off your own retro LAN or maybe visit our members' private LAN parties. We have a galleries, benchmark channels, where you can post images, videos of your retro hardware and your scores and much more. So come and join us and share your retro experience with us. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.